Hello. Today is Hello. Wednesday. It is the 25th of November in the year is 2020. My name is Sarah and I'm interviewing Renee Rodriguez for the oral for the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. So Thanks. please know Miss yeah. Please know, Ms. Rodriguez, that this recorded interview will be placed in the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection at the University of Texas at Austin. So if there's anything that you don't wish to answer or talk about, you know, we'll definitely honor your wishes. And also, if there's something that you do want to talk about, please bring it up and, and we'll talk about it. So Sounds because good. we're not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting. So I'll ask you a series of five questions and then just say, yes, I agree, or no, I don't agree after each one. So okay. there are two questions that we need to make sure you agree to before we go on. Um, so the first one is, Voces wishes to archive your interview along with any other photographs and other documentation at the Benson Library at the University of Texas at Austin. So we'll retain, you agree, okay, well, we'll, we'll retain copyright of the interview or any other materials that you donate to Voces. So I'm just going to ask you, you know, do you give Voces consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Benson Library? I agree, yes. Okay, great. Do you grant Voces copyright over the interview and any materials you provide? I agree, yes. Okay. Do you agree to allow us to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people all around the world? Yes, I agree. Okay. So we have um, we have some other questions in a pre-interview form that we've already filled out, and we use that information from the pre-interview form to help do the research. And the entire form is kept in a secure Voices server. So before we send it to the Benson, we'll definitely we'll strip out any contact information for your family or family members. So that won't be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at the Benson Library. Um, do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at the Benson? Yes. Okay. And then on occasion, Voices receives requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We will only deal with legitimate news outlets. So do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers or your email with journalists? Yes. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. Well, then with all of that sort of out of the way, we can go ahead and get started. Sounds good. So, yeah. So just to sort of, just to sort of start, um, could, could you just tell me a little bit about yourself? Well, yes, I, uh, first of all, I'm blessed to be alive and be here this morning to speak with you and the University of Texas and this wonderful, amazing program. I am 52 years old. I'm blessed to be 52. I am um, currently um, recovered now from COVID-19. As I said before, I'm also a terminal cancer survivor from 2014. And so that's why I'm so glad to see 52. I um, am I by trade uh, all my life. I've been a professional fine art photographer um, with the graduating from high school in Texas City, Sam Houston State University, 1993 graduate with a bachelor's of uh, arts in fine art photography degree. And have pursued a life of just uh, trying to go out there and make a difference like everybody. Uh, I'm currently uh, about to start a, a beautiful brand new um, returned relationship in my life uh, that was part of recovering from COVID, um, which I'm embarking on this new phase very, very immediately. Um, I'm the oldest of two. Um, my brother, Robert R. Rodriguez is nine years, uh, almost nine years younger than myself. And, um, Born and raised in Galveston, grew up in Texas City, Texas, and of two loving, beautiful parents. My father, Robert R. Rodriguez, has already passed last year. And, um, you know, I'm just here to, uh, to start and keep going, like all of us. And um, I'm here to just talk about that and, you know, what my impact of survival hopefully can can enhance and inspire anybody at this time. Yeah, well, that's a great introduction. You know, there's obviously a lot of different directions that I that I want to go and a lot of things I want to ask yourself or ask you about. Sorry, but I guess you. you know, 
we can talk a little bit about your growing up. So could, could you tell me a little bit about your, your upbringing? Absolutely. Uh, like I said, growing up, I was blessed to have uh, both parents all my life. Uh, very incredibly blessed to have a beautiful household, loving, loving parents. My mom and dad uh, were high school sweethearts at Ball High School in Galveston and um, were blessed to love each other for 54 years. Um, my parents um, built a home in Texas City, Texas when I was nine. So I originally uh, grew up going to Catholic school, St. Patrick's Catholic School in Galveston. And then when they built the home, I went to transition to public school in fourth grade. So that was a jolt on my life. But I can say from my early beginnings that my spirituality and my faith uh, was incredibly impressionable on me. Um, going to um, Catholic school. And that never left me. To this day, it is it is my functioning root of my soul uh, with myself as an, as an adult, as a human. Um, my spiritual self has guided me since childhood. Um, Mom and dad did a great job. You know, um, my mother had a 50-year career as a, a hairstylist, a beautician, cosmetologist. She's there at work as we speak at 76 now. Um, dad passed from a uh, cholangiocarcinoma in 2019 on Father's Day. Um, my brother and I, you know, loved my brother. We had a lot of love. Uh, my upbringing was filled with nothing but love. And I am beyond blessed for that. So a good life. It was a good life. And uh, as a child and, you know, um, I think growing up in Texas City, the transition from Galveston to Texas, Texas City is when I can say that my impression of environmental, because of growing up in the backyard of Amoco Refinery and the Monsanto Refineries and, and United States is huge hub of refineries. I'm right there in the backyard. I can say impressionably, I started realizing what can I do to talk about this? So my voice growing up in the backyard as an observer, as a photographer, um, my eyes were made aware early of awareness, even when I didn't realize that was part of my life. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I'd love to talk more about that. And again, you know, I'm, I'm, I am sorry to hear about, I am sorry to hear about your dad. And thanks Thank for you. You know, talking I about that. I appreciate like that. that. Yeah, that's yeah, okay. Like that. He's, he's with me here in this office. This is my father's office. So I, it couldn't be more fitting for me to have uh, my father's wall tribute wall here in the background of his service and um, my mom and dad's portrait of them um they're here with me so yeah that's really sweet i love that picture <laughs> thank you well i'm interested in what you were kind of saying about some of the things that you were noticing about you know montesano and um things that you sort of noticed growing up that made you um kind of inspired to do the things that you do today if you want to talk a little bit about that sure well my father was a self-taught uh photographer in vietnam those are his boots on the wall there um and ironically a uh, high school uh, art teacher at texas city high school um my mind is blank on his name right now drew those uh, my father's combat boots and his boonie hat but when he came back from vietnam he did he dabbled in photography early on to pass his time and keep his mind right, as he shared, uh, while he was in uh, in service in the war in 68-69. And so his first purchase is my beginning, if you will, of a camera from a native while on a convoy in, in Vietnam. Uh, they pulled over in my dad's job uh, in the army was to go and, you know, make sure everything was uh, safe. And there's this native there and there's a camera bag next to the guy. So there was nothing in the bag but a camera set up. Ironically, my dad paid $20 for the whole kit, the lenses, the filters, the 35 millimeter Minolta camera, brings it home. And as a child, as a four-year-old little girl, there I am playing with my dad's camera setup. Okay, he had Polaroid and everything. So my early beginnings of going into that question uh, forgive me for regressing further back, um, was literally the point of my life, my calling and my perspective has always been visionary. Okay, so my father's interest turned out to be my quest. 
um, as a, I, I'm born with a beautiful, beautiful gift of vision. And through creativity, my mother's mother was a painter and there's lots of artists in my mother's side. But so creativity is, is a gift, but vision has been my strongest gift. So as a child growing up in um, being impressioned by going to Catholic school and, and visually seeing, you know, every week going to my little catechism classes, I was enamored visually by the architecture of St. Patrick's Cathedral. The architecture opened up my mind, my, my vision. Going home and growing up in Texas City as a child, uh, going to public school, the environment became my vision. Okay, so being in the backyard of these refineries, and then in Texas City, there's these poles that have uh, sirens for, you know, warning signs. So that would go off. We had one right next to our house. So that always was. Um, it it opened up my vision of awareness. I I can say Texas City sharpened me in my childhood. In my heart, it impressioned. What am I going to do when I grow up with my camera? Unbeknownst to me in my childhood, I was developing these modes of awareness and and looking back and I as I think about this interview, wow, it's it's amazing to really your questions take me back to my early beginnings. I don't mean to be so verbal. It's where my heart is when I speak about my life, though. No, I, I want to hear all the things that you have to say about that. I think it's super interesting. So, yeah. Thank you. Well, well I, I love those stories. And how, um, could you talk a little bit about sort of your art now and what, what continues to inspire you and what you've sort of worked on in your adulthood? Absolutely. Uh, my photography has been with me since I was eight. Um, I always knew, I always knew I was going to grow up and be a professional photographer. I didn't know what kind of photographer. Um, my father started doing more along the lines. He was categorized as a photojournalist, very temporary. He um, wanted to do work with the Galveston Daily News, but um, work ensued and he ended up going into the refinery work and um, as a pipe fitter and the camera kind of was put down, but always put on the side. But that's where I came in and as a child was impression to go and learn the camera he taught me everything about the the 35 millimeter camera back in the day using film and so all of those early moments as uh where i'm at today were impressionable as far as um you have to see then you have to understand your tools before you can go out and use your voice okay so my whole life was preparation for the project work that I do today as a uh, fine art photographer, um, self-dubbed uh, social awareness artist. And I learned that terminology uh, through my participation through PhotoFest in 2018, the Houston International PhotoFest Biennial. I was blessed to be a meeting place participant. Uh, it is a very prestigious worldwide um, exhibition. Um, um, it's the biennial focuses on a particular topic and subject. And in 2018, I was blessed to have my name nominated and entered into the, um, the experience. And although I had always been a volunteer for over 10 years of my adult life with the photo fest, I had never, in 2010, I participated as a collaborative in a group exhibition on the exhibiting side. However, the ultimate elite space that I wanted to was the PhotoFest uh, meeting place. So I was blessed to produce a book, which is um, a nationally recognized project, a uh, tribute awareness for the 2016 Orlando Pulse nightclub, the 49 victims. I've created a very, very heartfelt special now trilogy um, honoring those 49 souls that I did not need to know to tell the world that they were important. Um, I created a 20 page book with no words. I bring the words in to life with a human element of presentation. The book uh, is called Redemptive Love. There's only one copy. 
I did not create the book for monetary value. And I will not until I understand that I've met the victim's families out of respect for them. I didn't create this to make money. I did it to honor human beings through my photography. So an exhibit was created in Galveston called Viva Pulse. And it was shown at the Galveston Art Walk in 2016. Um, that exhibit was then put to rest. And then a new exhibit I created called Pulsation in 2017 opened up the Strand Gallery from a very, very dear friend, Joey Caroga, who was the gallery owner in Galveston and invited me to open up his brand new gallery, returning Viva Pulse. But instead, because I never show the same work twice, I prayed about it. And instead I created a one year anniversary to the day exhibit opening with almost 300 individuals I invited the public to honor those 49 victims one year later. That has been put to rest and now significantly the book Redemptive Love was um, invited. One of my reviewers through the meeting place allowed me and invited me to the Museum of the Americas in Washington, D.C. I presented at the very first pop-up book fair, contemporary pop-up book fair is the first female, first Latina. Incredibly honored, very, very, very proud of that opportunity to use my voice, not for me, not for my name, but to honor 49 individuals that died in Orlando, okay? So the walk and the journey as a photographer, and I don't mean to be so verbal here, has been my biggest project to date. I did the commercial photography, I did the wedding photography, I did the gallery work photography, I've worked for the Dallas, uh, Cowboys through a subsidiary, not directly through um, a gallery that worked through the United Way, through special project work out of college, but in Dallas, Fort Worth. But um, the the heart of my work, contemporary wise, currently has been this significant project that is just the beginning of where I'm going, the remainder of my days with my work. Um, I've also done 20 years administrative assistant work with the state of Texas through UTMB in Galveston, as well as um, MD Anderson Cancer Center. That ended in 2014 due to health purposes and reasons. And then in my blessed, unbelievable recovery, I then have transitioned to five years of private hospice caregiving. So my hats have been many, very unique, but they all still return me back to the camera. And now at this phase of life, I'm prepping to take the first two thirds of the national project to the state of Texas in Austin with a pending solo exhibit that I have because of COVID turned my solo invitation at the rotunda at the state capitol next June, 2021 into a collaboration as a final trilogy um, tribute honoring those 49 souls. So that's a lot of around the world, yeah. but it's where I'm at. And it's been all over the place. My life has always been all over the place, but conceptually and visually, I even, as I grow and as I learn and as I dive and die and resurrect in my journey as a human, as a female, as an artist, I try to tie it all back together. Yeah, that's yeah. Well, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, those are, you know, very different career paths, but it seems like they're all kind of rooted in, in helping people too. So, so yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. Thank you. So I'm curious. Excuse me as I got to have no, a coffee. <laughs> I hear you, me too. <laughs> that is not a problem. Um, Thank you. <clears throat> excuse me. So you kind of mentioned COVID sort of disrupting some of your, your current um, sort of career plans. I'm curious, just kind of pivoting, I guess, to sort of talking about COVID a little bit. How did you first hear about COVID and when, when was it that you sort of realized that, that this, is, this is actually something that's, that's pretty serious? Could you talk a little bit about your sort of initial thoughts and, and realizations about it? Well, I was being, uh, I was a private hospice caregiver 
at the time, at the beginning of this year, working, um, taking care of um, a gentleman who I, I loved very deeply, um, suffering from Alzheimer's. And of course, being in the household, private hospice caregiving in Sugarland, Texas, um, is when the news started uh, flashing. So I worked seven days a week. I was working 61 hours a week, nonstop seven days a week. Well, excuse me, um, it was like Monday through Saturday, uh, but with a few hours off. Um, and then also running back here to check on my mother every single weekend, spending time just a day and a half, a night and a half with her and then turning around and going back. But between this household and my patient's household is when COVID was just blasting the news at the beginning of the year. Um, I did not have health benefits through that role. And I had a gap of no insurance for uh, from 2018 to January. So when COVID was blasting the news and, and then my, uh, my boss at the time um, crash educating themselves, you know, here we're in a household, we're in a family's household, all these things were, you know, like everyone, the world was racing, trying to figure out what do we do? What do we get? What, what supplies do we need? That's kind of the, the initial piece of like everybody, you know, everybody didn't understand what's this, what is going on? You know, things are flying off the shelves. How do we get alcohol? How do we get masks? How do we get gloves? How do we, how are we going to be protected in a household that's not ours? We have our own, it, it was chaos from the very beginning of this announcement. My experience and my exposure, like everybody's, was chaos. <laughs> and until I acquired COVID. Yeah, totally. Well, I guess I have two questions. For, do you remember, like, what time in the year it was that you sort of realized, like, oh, this is actually going to be something that's pretty, you know, world, world changing. Immediately. Immediate, wow. Immediately, yeah. Sarah, because instinctively, I roll my life, I'm rooted, and I'm centered spiritually. So I feel, I feel everything. I feel it, it's like I'm a walking thermometer in my life. And when you're taking care of patients, Although medicine was not my background medically, by trade, by certification, instinctively, I because of my what was supposed to be my demise in 2014 turned out to be my resurrection, and the way that I meditated in my wellness and my recovery from the most horrific um, moments of my life taking two years to come back and acclimate going, God called me to private hospice caregiving. And I was blessed to sit with a 96 year old lady who I didn't know, but I only knew her for less than two weeks and she passed kind of with me. It was as if she, I was called into something and, and, and that caregiving piece allowed my natural self, my nurturing side of me that I didn't understand and, and uh, grow into, but all these um, cancer, Alzheimer's, these chapters, COVID coming into COVID season allowed me to, it was almost as if my whole entire existence was prepped for demise in a very, very, um, strange turn of events for me. So when COVID hit the news and COVID became the news, um, there was a centered place of me spiritually that knew, okay, this is going to be big, but I've been through bigger. Okay. Now we're on a, a whole wavelength here. The world isn't prepared for something that, again, I speak in terms of kind of all over the place, but I'm an artist 24-7. Okay, I stand in my skin as a human being that's born as a creative to show and bring awareness. And so my vision of seeing COVID come was, wow, God really is trying to get the world's attention here. So spiritually, this is how I turned to my vision and my experience and my initiation like every human. But for me personally, COVID 
was the biggest wake up call that the world needed. And unfortunately, you know, again, I respect all faiths, all religions, all backgrounds, all nationalities, all cultures. I'm a lover of life. I'm a lover of culture and, and, and learning and understanding and, and, and being guided and inspired. So I know not all humans follow God. However, for me, as an artist, the COVID is something that as we go into the rest of the conversation, I can share more of where that conversation comes from. But, you know, it, you have to find where is your center when you face death, diagnosis, demise. Yeah. Where are you rooted to take yeah. on whatever's coming? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know I mean, that's a lot. I'm sorry, but <laughs> no, no, please don't, please don't be sorry. I mean, that is all stuff that, you know, I, I definitely think we should, we should talk about. And so I don't know if you want to sort of start by so kind of walking me through your experience with COVID, you know, I'd love to hear the, I mean, as much as you're comfortable to share, I'd love to sure. hear the, the details of sort of your diagnosis. And I don't know if you want to talk about um, your, your, cancer diagnosis and your experience with treatment too and how that kind of affected things um I'm not sure what sort of sort of order you think would be um the best to kind of tell these stories in but you know I really want to hear about both of them and how it and how it sort of changed your perspective on on all of these things well um I'm I'm comfortable to talk about almost anything I've thought about this because I really want to focus mostly on COVID, the COVID chapter, but I can't speak about the COVID chapter without talking about the significance of um, the cancer chapter. So, um, you know, papillary thyroid cancer is a, is a big deal. And I was blessed to go into um, everything happens for a reason. Okay. So, being an administrative assistant, ending a 10-year a career at UT and being Galveston, I was ready. I was in a different season of life, ready to transition to the big city, island girl with a camera, single, out of a, an extensive relationship that had ended that I was ready to move forward, and I was ready to embark on life. So in in that time frame, I decided to pack up and move to Houston. I got my job through MD Anderson Cancer Center, and I was very blessed to um, land as an administrative assistant in the Division of Internal Medicine with the division head and help support a um, beautiful team of approximately 13 executives from all over the world. And it wasn't an irony that God took me to an institution that uh, celebrated diversity, okay? So through that chapter, um, little did I know that the transition from Galveston UTMB to MD Anderson would ironically call me to my own health. So it's like being at the right desk at the right time on the right day with the right hour with the right person. That's the story so I won't go into all the details of all that perfectly uh, let me just say that yeah, cool. that desk opened another level of awareness for me as a human being deeply critically abundantly um, I was there nine years beautiful human beings that took care of me that supported me that celebrated me and it was time to move back to Galveston. And 2014, we'll just fast forward because I really wanna focus on COVID versus cancer, but for all those that are listening mm -hmm. and for all those that feel that diagnosis is the end, it's never the end. The end is what, when we have a piece of the experience as a human. I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not anything certified other than a photographer. But my life and my life's path with so many pieces of depth and deep and dark in some chapters, um, the camera has always allowed me, has been the magnet 
to my other magnet, okay? So as I've gravitated and grown as a human, I've turned to my inner self turns to the camera to see the good in, in all of the bad experiences. So through when I couldn't pick up the camera as a cancer patient, I just had the faith that I was in the right environment, that people who knew what they were doing were going to get me to where I needed to be. But we have to do the work too. So as a human, we have to also come to the game. And if cancer's the game, we got to come with our own strategy, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. And that's really with everything, whether it's career, whether it's relationship, whatever piece of the issue or the story is of our life, of our transition, we have to also come to the topic and we have to present from within ourselves. How are we going to survive? What do I need to do to get through this? So the cancer was a big one. <laughs> that was at the time, the biggest thing on the planet for me. And I was angry. I was mad. I was hurt. I was in disbelief. I was a lot of things that any human that goes through diagnosis will go through. I went through them all just like everybody. But for me, I'm always determined. And there's a tenacity that I have that I, I know that I'm here for the higher calling. And I had to get through it. So when I packed up my stuff and myself and friends came and helped get me back to Galveston in 2014 to call it a day, I wasn't ready death couldn't have me and I wasn't ready to give in so I meditated my way through a lot of pieces and in 15 months I launched my photography website okay so wow. it's it's about momentum of it's about balance it's about surviving anything and this is the precursor that I had to go through to get to the COVID piece of my life which is even just as equally profound because not as if that wasn't the biggest piece of life, COVID was bigger. So I had to go through the cancer to get to the, the survival of the COVID. And I'm telling you what, they're, they're night and day. Really? COVID yeah. is so much bigger and harder because it's your lungs sure yeah it's your Absolutely. lungs you know now i mean again i'm not an expert on anything i'm only an expert in surviving in this body right here and goodness gracious i have so much more to learn and so much more to go and i want i want to be here as long as i'm going to be here and i'm going to do the best i can like everybody we do the best we can hourly to get to the next hour to get to the next day um uh, I celebrate life. COVID is, uh, which is why we're here and why your beautiful program has invited me to speak about this is where I want to focus because that, um, I feel what I want to say about that deep experience on the exposure of COVID, um, is huge. Right. Yeah. Well, I would, you know, we, we want to hear all of the details about your experience and what you sort of took away from it. So whatever, you know, whatever the things are that you think are, are really important for us to hear and, and share, that's definitely what, what we want to know about. And I'm interested too, just in kind of um, what your experience was like, you know, like what symptoms you had and what you were feeling at the time. So, so yeah, if you want to just kind of talk about that sure. as much as you want. Well, um, as I've shared about being a private hospice caregiver starting the year off, um, you know, mind you, I'm coming off of a year 2019 was the biggest beast, as if 2014 wasn't one. But what I've learned spiritually, and I'm going to always reference that in my dialogue, because it's it's who I am, it is my roots. And it's my balance in my life. So as the chapter of the cancer piece of life, came and went thank god there was a went <laughs> okay i mean number one i wasn't supposed to see 47 and i'm 52 okay so then i'm being called to private hospice caregiving and who on the planet for me what i've ever thought 
I would have been called to a bedside of not one, but four human beings that were just beyond beautiful human beings, elderly um, people that um, I was called to be next to them. In 2019, my father received his diagnosis in March that he had stage four cholangiocarcinoma. He's a Vietnam veteran. He acquired it in Vietnam. That's a whole nother chapter, a whole nother story. But what I came to understand was the caregiving piece of my journey was the precursor to my father's experience. So here all along the line in the background as we're coming into COVID for 2020, I'm going through all of these phases of preparation and preparation and preparation for survival and diving and dying to get to COVID, okay? Um, fast forward, 2019 was a beast because I worked 20, I worked my 61 hours as a caregiver rushing up and down Highway 6, still trying to help maintain my parents' experience with my own father's uh, care. With, along with my brother, nothing was possible without my beautiful, beloved brother, Robert Ryan. And we were a team. My mother, my brother, and I were a deep, fierce, force team to help get my father through his experiences that we were running out of time. So 2019, with everything that it entailed for my father, and unfortunately, he lost his battle way too soon. We found out in April he was gone in June, okay? Then I handled mourning by overworking. So my body, in hindsight now, I can say this in November 2020, I just went to my primary care physician and my pulmonologist on the 23rd of November, and my lungs are 98% better. Wow, that's amazing. So we're talking a timeline that has just been like this and a life, my life, my body has been through so much. So when I look in hindsight, maybe when the COVID symptoms started, when I went, I had no um, insurance benefits for a couple of years. So my body was maxed out like from head to toe. I don't know where anything is. I don't know what my blood works like. I don't know what's going on in my body other than I hurt everywhere 24 seven, but I have learned to meditate through pain for two years of my life. I don't want to tell the whole world what my whole body's issues are because I don't want to focus on issues other than the topic, but I'm a hot mess from head to toe, but I'm alive. And, you know, 2019 beat me up. I've moved eight times physically. Wow. I've literally moved eight times as of Monday, coming back from the Valley since October of 2018, I have had eight moves. I only own the contents of a few boxes that I moved in my car. I only have possessions mean nothing to me. I have a storage unit with the contents of my life that are bare necessities of what I require. My camera, my mother, my brother, and the love of my life who's coming into my life is all that I need, okay? The rest, I got everything I need on me, okay? My, my father, he witnessed the journey of the art piece he taught me as a photographer all of that my family my brothers support everybody who knows and loves me going into COVID at the beginning of this year as a caregiver was uh profound because i was already exhausted and now when i look back at COVID for me this year i realize how horrible 2019 was on my body my mind my body my spirit was already exhausted so June 1 is when my um, health benefits kicked in. And I'm telling you, I was sliding into going to my first primary care, a brand new PCP doctor in Sugarland to be checked out. Everything was falling apart on me. I was just, you know, am I diabetic? Am I, you know, all these things. I'm just meditating and I have nothing left to meditate because I'm so exhausted. Mm -hmm. So I went into, came into COVID upside down and backwards. 
I don't know the dynamics of everybody's health with COVID. I just know that it's an upper respiratory situation. So I wake up on June 22nd to go to my appointment in Sugarland. I leave my little uh, rental efficiency rental in Rosenberg, Texas, where I was at for the longest chapter for nearly uh, 10 months. I wake up and I couldn't, I wanted to be early on time for the physician. I get there to the doctor's office and of all days, they have that Saharan dust storm going on over the area, over the city of Houston. Right. Right. So I'm literally just get in my car, go to the physician. I get inside the car. I go into the building. So from the car, the house to the car to the building, that was my only experience as far as the outdoor air. My appointment's at nine something in the morning. I get to her desk and I've already got major sinus trickle effect going on. Fast forward, Sarah, that day was the day that the world changed for me. Okay. So in a nutshell, I had basically the symptoms for me that day were rapid. It was sinusitis going into the throat, draining my ears, and I felt bad. So they were doing lab work on me. They were trying to get all this stuff, um, you know, oh, girl, you're a mess. We got to get this test done. We got to get this test. It's been a couple of years. Let's start from where, where we're at. Let's just start from scratch. She goes, I'm going to send you to the lab. Well, it was busy in that clinic. I've been going there for 10 years, but for, for some reason, I visually remember how many people were there. Some people were in masks, some people were not in masks. Right. I just remember how crowded it was. And the building is not that, that big, but there was a lot yeah. of people. And all I kept thinking is, is I don't feel well. So in a four hour time frame, being at the clinic, here I am experiencing major uh, transformation of like, my head's hurting me, like migraine, headache um, that wouldn't go away. So fast forward to that day from nine in the morning to one in the afternoon when I left. The symptoms were just tremendous. Before I left at two o'clock, I felt like, what's going on? I've only been here, but I don't feel well. Wow. So I leave by, by four o'clock, I get back to my little home and by five, um, Unfortunately, um, I had some circumstances at the household. There was no hot water. <laughs> um, there was just stuff going on. Um, anything that could happen, it was just a one in the day. I had a window yeah. unit in the house. So there I am. I'm, I'm feeling hot, like something's happening. I don't feel well. I'm going to take a shower. But it's like cold water and that cold water on my body with symptoms during the day and then i went and laid down by six o'clock i felt like the flu was coming on me wow. this is in one day yeah that's so that's such a fast onset of of in symptoms. one day in less than eight hours i was like in full full-fledged transformation physically I got in the bed, but then the air conditioning unit, the air was hitting me. I had a cold shower. So I thought, oh man, that wasn't smart, but I didn't have any energy. I called my mother. My mom said, Renee, come to Dickinson, pack your stuff and come here and rest here. Right. Number one mistake. Yeah. It's so hard to know in the, especially in those earlier stages, you know? So the fast forward, I come to my mother's, I have all my clothes. By nine o'clock the night on June 22nd, I'm having breathing problems. In less than 12 hours, I ended up calling the after hours clinic and I let them know uh, the after hours phone call. I said, something's not right. Never once, Sarah, did I think it was COVID. I wasn't in the mindset because I'm just going, 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 going in my life. I'm working, 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 working. The one day I go to the doctor's office on my very first day of my health insurance covered, again, God's timing. Talk about meticulous timing for God to present benefits to me. Yeah. Of the one day in my life in two years that I needed it most was on June 1st. June 22nd, it kicked in. Oh. And I fell apart on June 22nd. 
that's the truth. So I make it here and I'm letting them know something's not right. Nobody had the conversation of COVID with me. Not one person. They just, I said, look, I feel like I'm in full blown upper respiratory chest uh, cold. I need some antibiotics called in for me or whatever we got to do. I stayed here for five days and I progressively got worse with fever. The doctor said, let the medication kick in for three days. When Friday came around the 20 something, I can't think right now, fast forward, yeah. Sarah, I ended up having a virtual Zoom meeting with the brand new PCP on the morning of the 29th. And she said, oh my God, go straight to the emergency room. Wow. That must I have was been basically, I had COVID for that whole time, but wasn't diagnosed until June 29th at UTMB Lake City emergency room. My mother rushed me there. And unfortunately, my mother also had COVID at 76 years old. Wow. So UTMB helped, kept me overnight. They diagnosed me and then were spitting me back out to get me back home. They don't keep you, but I was in ICU for one night. Right. And I wasn't told that I needed, that I had double lung pneumonia also. Wow. So on June 29th, I spend the night there. On June 30th, my mother picks me up at the hospital, brings me home, and she's got all my stuff packed at the garage. I got to go back to Rosenberg. We can't get her sick. Well, in fact, she already had it. 72 hours later, she was diagnosed at the same right. hospital in the same ER. Neither one of us knew we had double lung pneumonia. Wow. Wow. So I go home to Rosenberg and uh, I suffered horribly by myself in my little home, in my one room efficiency, 400 square foot efficiency in Rosenberg. And I literally knew I was in trouble at that time. It was an upper respiratory situation. I didn't know I had double lung pneumonia. So my fever was spiking high, low, high, low, high, low. And I actually found on my cell phone, I found yesterday on this, a screenshot on my notepad in this phone, I still have, which I want to use in an exhibit in the future when I have a COVID awareness exhibit celebrating yeah, yeah. this story and everybody. Um, I kept a screenshot of all of my times and all of my temperatures, and I have a whole page. And it's really unbelievable when I look back as an observer and I see what that three days of my life was. And I almost died in my little space. By Friday, July 3rd, I couldn't breathe. There was no air coming in. I was passing out. I was getting black spots. I was seeing black spots, and I knew seriously, seriously, I was in serious trouble. I was gasping for air on that morning and I called Rosenberg uh, EMS and I said I needed an ambulance ASAP. I was going out, I was checking out. And all oh, yeah. along, it was my meditation practice that helped me survive that, that day of life. All those years of being stubborn caught up with me and helped me survive. I knew, and my father had always taught me how to calm my own heartbeats down by breathing. And in your mind, you have to relax through an a, asthma attack, calm your breathing down. And I calmed myself down as I waited and counted for EMS to show up and they rushed to me on July 3rd and I was going into full blown upper respiratory chest failure. Wow. So you were alone in that moment when you I was alone and they came. I had God though. I had yeah. God. And this yeah. necklace that I wear, I held on to it. I wouldn't let go of it. It was my only thing oh, I was holding wow. on to that morning by myself. And I was leaning against my door and I unlocked the door. There was some dogs on site and I said, I cannot get away from the door because if I I'm not going down because if I do, at least I'm at the door for them. Right. Right. That's how fast that day of life that COVID was working in my body. But my mindset wasn't letting go of God for me. Okay. So fast forward to that morning. Here comes EMS. Here comes all the paramedics. Here comes, there was eight people trying to get my big girl self on the stretcher 
through a backyard, through rain and mud and mosquitoes, and oh my word, down 59, we get to Methodist emergency room, and I'll never forget seeing through the glass window, and they're shoving adrenaline in me, oxygen in me. My O2 was incredibly low, and I, I couldn't really hear. My hearing kind of was like the pressure was so tremendous in my head and I was seeing movement, but I was like inside of my head, everything was in slow motion. And all I was doing was watching the cars down 59 as I was being rushed and I heard the girl talking, but I don't know really what she said. And I was oh. just telling God, hold me, hold me. I'm not letting go. I'm not ready. I can do this. And I knew I was okay because I was with professionals. Okay. So when I get to the emergency room, there is a line, there is a caravan of emergency ambulances that we were surpassing and they were calling in when we got into the ER. Now I'm up on the stretcher and they're running with me at this point. And again, everything is in slow motion. And I literally saw the, it was like a concert, but inside the entire floor of the Methodist emergency room here on 59 in Sugarland, the whole room was full of stretchers with their EMS, all these patients waiting. I beat every single one of them and they got me into a room. That's how bad it was. Wow. Wow. Do you this think all of July this? July 3rd. Yeah. Do you, what, did you notice that the hospital was, was full of sort of patients um, being treated for COVID too? Every, the, my EMS girl told me these are all COVID patients. Wow. And she says, we're getting you in. She wouldn't let go of me. This, bless her heart, I can't think of her, her name right now, but she was Hispanic and she was just fierce. And she said, not today. She says, I got a good rate. You know, like she took such pride, which is why as a, a photographer, there are so many people that I want to thank. And I want to use uh, my invitation to exhibit in Austin, ultimately, to bring awareness to the healthcare providers. Because the next piece of what I wish to say, and forgive me, Sarah, for being so verbal, no, um, I, I is even bigger. Like so I get into the room. They immediately get me in. The chief of staff doctor comes in. The pulmonologist comes in. And he's slapping his hands real hard, like snapping me out of it. Because I, I guess for, I was wondering, why is he doing that? But in, in my moments, I wasn't so coherent. So he was trying to get my attention and he was shouting and he said, you're going to, you're going to get out of here. You're going to get out of here. And I, I could see him. I could read wow. lips because my mother's hard of hearing. So I was reading his lips and I was just nodding at him, but I couldn't speak because I had oxygen and so much was going on. 10 days later. So I'm admitted into ICU COVID unit at Methodist. I'm put up into a room. I don't know what floor I'm on. I don't know where I'm at. I know I'm in Methodist <laughs> and it's isolation. All of the healthcare workers that took care of me, the reason I'm here with you today, this morning, is because of so many beautiful souls. Oh my gosh, the doctors, the nurses, the housekeepers, the techs, the radiology techs. Everybody looked like astronauts. Those poor souls are working so hard. And it's so critical, like when I met you a couple of weeks ago and told you, it's unbelievable. The world needs to understand that COVID is so real. Let this interview, let this story, let this one piece of this big pandemic, I'm just one voice here, everybody. But let me just say that these human beings that get up and go to work, just like you're at work right now with me, these people are risking their lives to help save our life. They got children, they have families, they have their own families are in hospitals that they can't see, but they took care of me. And I mean to tell you, God presented the biggest and most beautiful team for this life right here. I'm so humble and so undeserving 
but God put the best team for me together in Houston's Methodist Hospital the week of July 3rd through July 11th. I'm here because of those souls. And I will honor them all the days of my life. I never put the TV on one time. Because as a female, as a person that has um, gone through the depths of what death looks like, and I've been around death so, so, so deeply, COVID's experience in near death was on another complete another level because I'm attached to wires all over my body, literally oxygen. I was one digit away from being put on a ventilator. And that one digit, I kept telling them, lower, lower the oxygen, don't raise it. They kept coming in every, only every four hours I was able to see a human being, by the way. So they call you up and they ask you, you know, so for everybody who doesn't want to wear a mask today on November 25th, 2020, let me tell you, mm -hmm. when the moment comes and God forbid the moment should ever come and strike your body, but when the moment comes and you have to go to where I've been, you're going to understand what the mask means. You're going to understand the severity of wearing a mask, not for yourself, do it for everybody else out there. If you're, you're young and you don't understand and you don't believe that this is real, that you want to go out and live life and, and, you know, be sociable and you know what, living is all you got to want to do and you want it and you want to do it for all the people you love. These people are risking their lives to get you in and out of the hospital. And I am beyond blessed why my life has uniquely been blessed to go through these two depths of death, take care of death, help be part of calling my father to his transition in the afterlife. I tell you what, I'm ready to go live the rest of my days, Sarah. And I'm ready through this interview to tell the world, get out there, put your masks on, help do your part. You know, in those, um, that week of life in the hospital room that I did not look at social media, I refused to look at TV. There's nothing worse than being on oxygen one digit away from the pandemic for the news to be bombarding you, but we need to hear it, but we don't need to hear it when we're in those moments. So what did I do? shut the world out and I meditated with God. And for the irony of seven additional days, seven being the number of completion spiritually, God needed to tell me some more messaging apparently. So I laid there and I meditated on a whole new level. And that's when I just pleaded, not for life, but I pleaded spiritually for the opportunity that when I walked out of there, that I would serve God all the days of my life as a visual artist to help bring awareness to everybody's uh, voices and, and their, their issues and things that are important. But I guess what I want to say through this interview, Sarah, additionally, yeah. is the fact that COVID, like all diagnosis, like cancer. Right. When the topic and when the issue comes to your life, it's mental. Yeah. So with cancer, survival is, it's, I don't know what the percentages are for medicine, but the other half of your surviving battle is mental and emotional and physical and spiritual. When your body is caving in, where do you rely on? You have to rely on the mental capacity and the emotional piece of you and whatever spiritual faith that you have, whatever you call what your world is to, to elevate you through and balance you. Everybody has to have that, but you got to do the work. So COVID took me to a whole nother level. The cancer didn't because you're laying on your back and you're attached to an oxygen machine and you're mentally battling and you're emotionally battling. Nobody can go see you. You have no relatives. I had this phone was all I had by my side for those seven days. This was my world was right here. But what I had to understand was I didn't need anybody in this. I had everybody through God. 
he flattened me one more time to tell me there was something more I needed to learn. So I'm not going to get into the specifics of spirituality on your interview because I'm not that person. I bring it to I bring it to verbally share of what it took for me to survive two major chapters of near death. Yeah, without yeah, it, I yeah. wouldn't be here. Um, of course, without modern medicine, I wouldn't be here. Right. Um, COVID is real. Yeah. COVID is devastating. But like cancer and COVID, what is your part? Where are you centered as a human being going into anything? You know, we don't know what our day has. I don't know what the next 12 hours of this day look like. I just know that I never want one of my messages, his importance here for your viewers is, I never want to allow death to put life into perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's, yeah, I think that's a great message for, for all of this. And yeah, that's interesting. It does seem like there's, you know, similarities between those two diagnoses, right? Because COVID is so new and treatment is sort of up in the air and it, it seems like it would feel like um, you wouldn't be be sort of sure what was going to happen to you kind of similar with a, with a cancer diagnosis where, you know, there's no, there's not really an easy treatment or an easy or an easy path out of it. Did how what um what kinds of feelings did you have when you received both of these diagnoses and were they were they at all similar? And how did it feel? Did it feel isolating at all? Or what what sort of emotions were you experiencing? Chaos in both worlds. Wow. Initially, yeah. I mean, the first thing a human being I can't speak for anybody. Like I said, sir, just myself. But the first thing that a human being will, the, the mere, the mere thought, the word cancer all by itself, you're in the coffin. You're already dead. Okay. You're already on the other end of the spectrum of the meter of devastation. Right. The mind does that. Now I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but I don't know what that is. But because my life has been rooted spiritually since I was a child, I'm like, okay, cancer, you have COVID. Wow, it is a shock. I mean, they're both a shock. They're both a shock, you know? And it's like, okay, but you know what? I have a higher physician. God bless every physician here today in this world, all yeah. over the world. I honor and I give tribute and I elevate everyone. But my higher physician is up there for this yeah. woman right here. Okay, so... Yeah. I already am like, okay, I've been here before. Now it's the lungs. Now it's like I'm tied to this. And now look how fast everything is like lightning speed. The COVID is like this. I don't know. I, I know from working at MD Anderson at the time back in the day, there was, I remember like 27 cancers. In 2020, I don't know what that number is. I don't know. One of them my, I'd never heard of, and it took my father, the deadliest liver cancer on the planet. However, COVID, oh my gosh. So I'm in ICU and my mother's in ICU. She's here. And I had to, I could recognize all the pulmonary breathing issues that she was dilapidating here at the house. And I had to verbally use energy I didn't have to encourage her to go get checked. And sure enough, she, we could have lost her here in the house. So in my seven days, I was not only meditating for me, I was channeling my mother and, and communicating with my brother to go get mama. She's going down in the house because I just came from there in Rosenberg and I know where she's headed. So COVID was uh, a lot of elevated, escalated emotions that there's no time. It's now. It's yesterday. Okay. Like the doctor was clapping. It's wake up. <clears throat> so again, it's like, um, I don't know, for those who have had panic attacks and for those who have asthma, and when you're in an ex uh, exacerbated, uh, elevated you're going into panic mode. 
you got to calm down. You got to meditate. You got to know and you got to visually close your eyes and you have to meditate your breathing. So in essence, my father saved my life. Again, my, my biological father, when he taught me when I was younger how to calm my heart rate down, I remember that and I practiced that and I have beautiful souls in my life that they know that I've had uh, asthma and bronchitis issues. And so that if I'm in an attack mode and I need somebody on the other end of the phone, you better have a lifeline person that knows when they hear you, don't panic. Calm down because panicking closes up the lungs even harder. Okay, so you have to have somebody in your lifeline to call and sit, calm you down, calm you down, calm you down. But when you don't have anybody, and there's millions of people, Sarah, that, that have no one, or thousands of people that have no one, and that are going to go through COVID. And I guess I want this interview, other than my jibber jabber, the biggest message is I want to remind everybody calm down. Calm down. We have all of the tools that we need to survive as a human being. We're presented with everything we need to survive, mind, body, spirit. When our body is failing us, we have our mind. Maybe our mind is failing us and we can't direct the rest. That's a different story. I can't go into that. I don't know that life. But I know for all of us that have this, we have to calm down the rest of this, the body, mentally focus again i'm not a i'm not a medical profession on any level i only know what it took for myself to survive two major 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 overhaul life-changing episodes that were near death at death's door seconds away in both chapters and for whatever reason god has called me to still be here i've got friends that out of love they joke with me where you've passed up your nine cat lives I don't take it for granted. I can laugh about things, but there's nothing funny, but I have to make light of the circumstance and I'm so blessed. Then mm -hmm. there's a reason I'm supposed to be here. There's a reason that I'm supposed to be on your interview. There's a reason I'm supposed to, hopefully something I have to say will strike somebody. Somebody needs to hear these words. I don't know what, I know hopefully I'm making some sense somewhere. Yeah, well, I think, I think you're making a lot of sense. I think this is very, Thank I you, think, Sarah. yeah, this is really important for people to hear. <laughs> I'm, I want to talk a little bit about, I remember when we talked last time, you told some stories about some of the um, healthcare professionals that were taking care of you. I remember one story in particular you told about um, a, a doctor who almost fainted when he was, when he was taking care of you. Could you tell that story? Bless his heart. He actually, I'm sorry, I don't think he was a doctor. He was a tech. Okay. Uh, he was a tech. He wasn't. Um, I'm sorry. It wasn't. I stand corrected. He was not a physician. He was a, um, a respiratory therapist. So I don't know if he was a, a doctor. I don't know if they're right. doctors, but he came to me um, and bless his heart. He was young and he was one of at least three staff members. Um, thank goodness. I would never say names. I don't remember their names, unfortunately, but bless his heart they were fatigued. They were exhausted. And I witnessed bedside the very immediately once I was put into the room, the level, I mean, we're talking astronaut uniforms that these poor souls are wearing to work in. They're, they are bubbled out like if you're like in a um, high level governmental shut down situation with the glass shield, the helmet hat, the hose and everything, the pack, the air pack and the gloves and they're so hot. And then some that don't even have that capacity to wear that type of protection. They have just the, the gowns, they're triple, double, you know, the gloves, the, the wristbands. I mean, every piece of sealing their body for coming in to take care of you. So they're hot, you see the fatigue on their face, all the healthcare workers, even the housekeeping lady. Oh my gosh, you know, but this one particular uh, fella, he came in in the morning and oh my gosh, he just leaned, you know, he brought the machine and 
and I could just see his mannerisms because I feel everything. His mannerisms just were not on par. And I could tell from the moment he entered, he was almost, bless his heart, he just wasn't at the energy level he needed to be at. And in no shape or form calling out anybody in that facility. The bottom line is, is that individual, I just said he was so full of sweat. And I asked him and I put my hand on his wrist and I said, dear, I need you to be strong because I need you today. Ain't nobody going to go down at this bedside. If I'm not, you're not. <laughs> and I'm like, I need you to just breathe. It's okay. That caregiver in me came out of me bedside and I don't know why. And I didn't mind it. I have no problem with it. There was no complaint. I felt so bad for this person that was there to take care of me that it's like, what on earth? You're exhausted, fella. Catch your breath. It's okay. And I appreciate you. And I told him, I said, I want you to know how deeply grateful I am. You're in my room for me today, but you're not going down. <laughs> Just like I'm not gonna go down, you're not gonna go down today, okay? So I said, catch your breath, snap out of it, go get some water, I'm okay, I'm alive right now, I'm alive right now, but I need you to get well, cause I need you. And right. I was able to talk to him and I was talking to myself <laughs> at the same time. And I yeah. didn't realize you really remembered that story, but it was a very real moment, you know, yeah. and it wasn't just him. There were females that the fatigue is tremendous. They're working 16, 17, 18 hours, some of them, and yeah. they're exhausted. Yeah. I love those yeah. stories. Sorry. Please continue. It's okay. That's okay. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, you know, yeah, I love those stories of, um, like you said earlier, kind of when you were first brought into the emergency room and, and the um, doctor was kind of shaking you and, and um, what, how did that, how did that affect you? Those sort of like really personal, like interpersonal moments between you and the caregivers? Um, very personal, very impressionable. So in the moments that I couldn't hear, but I could see all this motion going on around me, I was aware that, wow, I'm in bad shape because I can't hear. I'm in real bad shape because so many were coming and flooding me so quickly. And this guy is just beating his hands like this. And this pulmonologist, oh my word, oh my stars. I give my whole life to this man on this earth. He's the one that snapped me out of it because visually, because I'm a visual, I'm a visionary. That pounding of his hand is what I saw. That inspired me. Okay, here's somebody I don't know, and he's so passionately trying to get my attention to snap out of this and to hold on, and that I'm going to walk out. That is what I saw. And as a photographer, I see everything. That that experience of that healthcare worker giving me himself, that was everything to me. You know, I spent uh, 19 years as an administrative assistant between UTMB and MD Anderson. And even though I wasn't on the floor with patients, I mean to tell you that other piece of my life outside of photography, customer service through that type of work, which is what I live for, I love helping that's why I was in it so long. It wasn't just a job and to pay the bills and then I could be the photographer on this side of my life. It's what I love. I love helping. And that piece of life, when you have to be a patient, which I've been a patient for so many years now on two different levels and then some in between. I always have said, and I even worked at UTMB School of Medicine and the UTMB Admissions Office for School of Medicine in Old Red in Galveston, Texas. And I always told these students, I'm just a senior secretary at the time, but let me tell you something, because I've been a patient for a long time. When you graduate in medicine, you're doing it for the higher calling. That's what God has called you to do or whoever your faith is. Don't ever, ever think you're going to go into medicine without the compassionate side of being compassionate because school doesn't teach you compassion. And so in my journey at the desk, I always tried to leave that verbal with those students that I got to blessedly meet along the way through the administrative piece. Don't forget 
the passionate and compassionate side of what you're going to go do for people. You treat them as if they're your mother, your brother, your father, your grandmother. Okay, because those people helped me in all my moments. So I was just verbally passing it forward. When this gentleman here at Methodist, God bless him, I can't wait to go see him now that I'm better. You know, I want to send him flowers, you know, or something just to thank Man. him because it was that pounding. He put himself there. That's what you can't teach in medicine. And in COVID, for some reason, that man's pounding of his hands got my verbal attention to fight. And I fought in my bed and in my room for seven days. And I fought with God's attention. And I said, I got to get up. He would come in every morning at 820. How are we doing, Rodriguez? Where are we at? Okay, well, I want you out of here. Because the longer you're in here, you're not going to walk out of here because I don't want you to get anything that's on the floor. Wow. I need you to get up and get moving. And then I got up. I said, God, on day two, I said, okay, I need to sit up. On day three, I put my legs over the bed. On day four, I stood up. On day five, I walked into the room. On day six, I didn't want any help. I sat in my chair and ordered my food in the chair. On day seven, I left. Wow. How has recovery been? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sort of where I know you mentioned, you know, you well, move, you've been moving <laughs> around a lot. And then what has recovery been like? Yeah, I guess in terms of sort of where you've been and, and who you've been around, but also physically, how have you been, how have you been recovering sort of physically? I, I was dismissed in the first week I left on July 11th. I was discharged from Methodist. Um, I had to take a detour I couldn't go home because my home was not equipped. Uh, I needed circulation with central air and heat, but I had a window unit. So there was a lot of fear tied into um, after surviving the experience and then discharge, then the next bigger challenge of survival continued because we're in quarantine mode. So you have to quarantine for two more weeks, okay, after discharge. I had to take a detour and I was in isolation in one room for seven additional days. Okay, offsite. I wasn't at home. I was just offsite for seven additional days. And I had the blessing of a family out of the valley, uh, a friend and family who literally um, just embraced me and provided this space for me to be in. So from the transition from the hospital to this space, I sat there for seven more days in isolation with, by myself, nobody could be there. And then I also had food delivered to me the, to the door. I had friends uh, door dash me food. Um, and uh, I, I was provided for. Again, it took a village. Okay, Sarah, survival is all encompassing. Survival starts with you here, okay? It starts with whatever spiritual foundation and tether that you want to hold on to and never let go of. And then the rest is environmentally, your, your family, your friends, your support behind it. Surviving takes work. But if you have the mind and the heart, you're going to live. I, I can't explain. Unfortunately, daddy didn't have that opportunity. His body failed him, but his mind was there and his heart was there. Okay. Um, everybody's dynamic of, of near death is going to always be different, obviously, as a human being. But that, that village that I had of coming out of the hospital and transition for one week was hard because I didn't have the 24 hour attention. So it was incredible high anxiety. Trust me, I'm, I've not always been this strong, and I have my moments like everybody. I'm not invincible, even though I love Wonder Woman and she's my lady. It's, I'm not Wonder Woman. <laughs> um, I just, it's, it is hard. It's a lot of work to survive, but it's worth it. Now, I can say in a, definitively, anybody who doesn't want to do the work, the outcome will be different immediately. That's a personal thing, okay? I had the battle of my mother dealing with COVID. 
I was estranged from every human being. I was no longer with the 24 seven of my team. I was already going into like an emotional detachment of not having my team there that was in the hospital. And what I did in isolation for seven days was a whole nother level of mental, emotional that I had to, I'm on a machine. I'm, I'm in a, I'm, I've got a machine that I have to run and I'm, I'm on the oxygen and they sent me the packs of the, wow. the oxygen tanks. And we're talking a whole nother level of, I didn't want to say the F word, but fear is on a whole nother level when you don't have a team with you. Yeah, you go, back to, you go back to right here. Yeah, wow, I did not realize that. So you got, so when you got discharged, you were, I mean, if if you had, so you had to be on oxygen still, and, and I could manage not that come off of it. I mean, technically, wow. you have to be on it. I weaned. I I told myself I can't do this. You can't shower. You can't go to the restroom. You can't right. do anything because you're tethered to a machine. And right. then if you have to leave, you have a backpack. To a portable right. and that oxygen stuff just scared the heck out of me and I didn't want that so I mentally told myself I'm going to overcome this I can't leave this room I want to be off the oxygen before I leave this room because I don't want to live like this anymore all I knew Sarah is that oxygen means that my body's not breathing by itself that's not good right. Right. I can't live like that yeah, I got too much stuff to do in my life. I didn't come this far to get to, to survive on an oxygen machine. So again, that's where that internal survival, your whole life is coming into play into a circumstance, into a crisis. Basically, humans are already prepping all their life for a crisis. What do you do when the crisis gets here? Well, you've got to breathe. Yeah. And when you can't breathe because COVID's got you on a damn oxygen machine, well, guess what? You have your mind yeah. to calm yes. down your breathing. Wow. And my daddy, again, helped me with that. Those lessons in life. Maybe it's one message. Maybe my message today for somebody that's sitting out there that's going to look at this interview. And if they're even going to have the moment to sit and listen to my voice, if there's anything you walk away from my experience on this program, God bless the University of Texas and God bless your whole staff and the founder of this vision of this project to have an opportunity to say what, remember this, <laughs> breathe, just breathe, just calm down, slow your roll, breathe. It's one step at a time. It's one hour at a time. Nothing is immediate. Don't go put yourself in a coffin because you hear this. Because fear will kick in. For me, fear is the devil. That's the opposite end of who I am as a human being. So spiritually for myself, I learned that I'm already taken care of. I have all the tools I need. I need to slow my thoughts down so that I could get through the steps and the process of what's coming. Digest things. Don't manifest things negatively. Listen to what people have to say. Knowledge is power. Everything's going to be okay. It's a process. And there's people that have been through far greater than me, Sarah. There's people that have survived things that have lost limbs, have, I can't even imagine. I mean, the levels of trauma and, and drama for people, I can't imagine. I only know my story. And for COVID, I just want people to understand it's real people. Take, take the precautions, wash your hands continuously, check your temperature, be safe slow your roll social distance do all the things that we're told we need to do you know my pulmonologist just told me so yeah so i went from that experience to <clears throat> then i had to go into a little home back to that home and so for 28 days more i had to double quarantine i had to schedule my own covid retesting twice with utmb in Rosenberg. So when I walked outside of my home 28 days later, I'll never forget, Sarah, 
what wind felt like on my face. I felt fresh air on my skin. I had a former hairdresser and her husband and brand new no newborn baby from the other side of Houston make me homemade soup, buy me some, um, all like this whole little care package kit of Gatorade and, and water and brownies and um, the soup and, they drove all the way across the city of Houston and put it on my car trunk for me because I couldn't, they couldn't get out of the vehicle and they delivered me a care package. I had other friends, like I said, during the, the room stay, I was isolated, deliver me um, um, food at my door. Um, I had countless phone calls. The phone became the survival tool, okay, to the outside world. Mom and I continuously, how are you today, mama? How are you today, daughter? You know, that constant connection, but it's here. So when you're in isolation, yeah, it's tough. I had a cousin going through it and I was able to pray with him in Texas City and, and we were constant, a magnet support so many people were going through anxiety. I had friends that were checking on me around the clock and it's like COVID became a way of life, Sarah. It was my life, but I didn't want it to be my entire life. So now I'm here. So yeah, so fast forward from 28 days of additional isolation and in quarantine, I got cleared. But then when I went to the pulmonologist in August, he said, Miss Rodriguez, and I felt good. I was ready to roll, Sarah but my body wasn't. And he said, Renee, I'm sorry to tell you, you still have a palm sized patch of double lung pneumonia in your left lung. What a jolt. I don't hear you, but, um, sorry, okay. I, no, I'm just... no, no, no. Uh, so uh, that was a shock. That was wow. a shock. And that, that just let me know. So when I went into from the, the hospital to the room and I was still on oxygen, I, right. I weaned myself in 72 hours from the machine. Wow. I, too soon, but uh, it, it wasn't a contributor to, because I was on all that, I had like seven antibiotics. I have a photograph because of course I documented my whole experience right. as a photographer. Right. From the ER, from the, the transport in the, on the gurney, I was taking photographs. Wow. Even though I was not coherent. Right. I have my shoes and I have Highway 59, a visual. I have inside of the room, I have a, a chronological visual of my moments. One shot, one, one, it's all it'll take is one image. And I put for breakfast every morning, I prepared my own breakfast and I had an entire desk of medications that was my breakfast for first of all. So I wanted people to see what COVID looks like, what it was every day to survive, to get to where I'm at today, okay? Inhalers, supplements, antibiotics, my stars. I had people that it took a team in a village to go get the pharmacy to deliver it to me, to go get the groceries to deliver it to me to make the food to deliver it to me. It took a village, Sarah, to get me to your desk today. So when they told me that I had that patch of pneumonia and he said, you need another 45 to 60 days of recovery, go be still somewhere. Well, little did I know because I lost my job as a caregiver. Right. I have not worked since June 22nd, Sarah. Wow. Praise God for pandemic unemployment right. i'm not ashamed to say no. for the first time in my life you know resources are critical it's difficult it has been horrible i lost my home i lost my space but i have my life yeah and i have i have me to start all over again again and I've oh, had a yeah. lot of agains, but I'm here to do it again. And you know what? All that stuff comes over time. And that's all fixable. Jobs are fixable. Yeah. Career yeah. is fixable. 
as long as you have your life. So I was blessed to go stay and be very still in, in Brownsville, Texas, in a home, a beautiful mansion. And I had some um, wonderful people who took care of me. And all I did was get bigger and everything is wonderful in Brownsville, it's healthy. And I was still for those extra 45 to 60 days. So from September 1st through Monday, the 20th or whatever day Monday was, um, I recovered. And I dived spiritually. So for September, I slept for one month. I slept for 30 days. Wow. I was still, wow. I did nothing. I was a sloth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I rested. October. I started coming back to life and I started saying, okay, it's time to get busy. November is here. I'm glad to be back home at my mother's. I'm glad to see her. I've seen my brother. I can't wait to start uh, my love life again. It's here yeah. and I'm ready to go out and be the best version of a human being of myself with this second new beginning and new rebirth. I'm blessed to tell the world what my story my only version of you know i mean my journey with covid and what i wanted to say and be part of this project is that devastation doesn't have to look devastating i want to be that one human to show the world guess what it was hard was deeply hard right. mentally emotionally physically spiritually hard but no matter if it's cancer, divorce, separation, career ending, whatever the topic is, it, it doesn't have to end that way. You're going to go through it. But what your perspective is, is how you're going to get through it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, wow, well, that's all. I mean, you've had like an incredible life story. Um, I guess I'll, you know, I'll ask you one more thing. I mean, you, you talked about kind of losing your job as a result of all of this. And I know that's something that's a lot of people have, have experienced kind of losing their job. I saw it, you know, I think more people than ever experiencing things like food insecurity and things like that. How is, how is this, the pandemic and in, in your personal experience with COVID sort of shaped your, your perception of those kinds of things going on in the world and I mean especially in our in our country oh my gosh talk about transition and all that 2019 has been for us all in humanity uh for me personally I've lost I had lost all of my I lost my roof in essence I lost um my job um to sustain because physically I have not been able to go out and embark. I mean, I just went on the 23rd. So from June 22nd to June 20, I mean, to November 23rd, I've been under, excuse me, doctor's care. <coughs> Pardon. Excuse me. Bless you, um, right. Excuse me one moment. <laughs> um, and so everything is looking good. Um, however, the logistics of survival have just been unbelievable because the strain and the stress of being in a double quarantine and then having to know where are you going to live, where are you going to go? I couldn't come to my mother's because she was also in quarantine. I couldn't infect anybody else. So to have the blessings of having a human being in Brownsville who decides to open their door to somebody recovering from COVID was profound. That's all God. So being at ground zero at 52, you know, I can only say, praise God. I wasn't blessed to have children of my own uh, physically. However, um, you know, I always wanted children and I've been an honorary mother many times through chapters, praise God. But I can't even imagine going through what I just went through and having children to provide for and school. And I, I, my mind just explodes to think what parents have had to do. And I'm just by myself. 
but I'm still a lot of responsibility because I have all of these health circumstances, but yet I've always tried my best to overcome and do everything on my own, but we have moments, and this was one of them, where you're so vulnerable and you're so in need that you need, and it's okay, and I guess I also want to share that with your viewers, is that there's no shame in needing resource assistance. Thank you for the state of Texas that in the United States that we are in a country that we have something. It's not always going to be everything, but it's something to get by. And I'm telling you from every chapter, all the companies, my car company, my insurance, you know, everything that has been hard. Thank you, God, that I had some form of something to get by. Of course, the times are hard. Of course, I'm still in great. What am I going to do next? <laughs> I'm going into a new chapter and I'm, I've got to come to the door and I'm, there's no pressure there, but I put the pressure on me. And, you know, we have to take those steps and we'll get there. But at least I have my life to go take the steps all over again. So, yes, you know, the basic necessities that, pen, that, that COVID shuts the body down. And I'm just one story for your, your program, Sarah, but just to say that, wow, COVID wants to come out and it's here to slay. But guess what? If COVID should come to your life, you already have a sword. And whoever you believe in, like I said, I respect all faiths and all cultures. Whoever your higher self is that you believe in, you're covered. You got this. You have to be comfortable and you have to have faith that you're going to get it through. Faith versus fear. Okay. So, yeah, the necessities uh, were the biggest piece that were hard for me to digest. The COVID, um, you know, it's coming in. It's not only attacking your body, but then here comes the job. Here comes the food. Yeah, you know. Food stamps. I'm not ashamed to say I had to be on them. Thank you, God, okay. for the benefits. Thank you, Lord, for mm -hmm. the moments. And, you know, I had something he provides. Okay. You know, and I'm a big advocate for anybody and everybody that, you know, we're in a country and with all the transition that the United States went through in 2019, my gosh, as if COVID wasn't enough. Now, I'm not a politician. I'm not going to put any of my beliefs on that. But because right. I was a recipient of being a citizen during COVID, I'm so grateful that I live in a country. <clears throat> I don't care what side of the country. I don't care what right. chapter right. anybody, red or blue. I'm a human being, and I'm grateful that I was in a country during COVID that provided some benefits to me, that I had something. I'm so grateful. Okay, so every crisis is going to bring crisis. Again, it's perspective. So yeah, I've lost all of that, but I didn't lose my life. Right. Yeah. And I'm excited that I'm going to get to go embark on what is what is next for me, you know? Yeah. yeah, that's a great point that crisis brings crisis. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I think this is a good kind of stopping point, you know, but if there's anything, if there's anything that you want to add about um, your experience or if there's sort of anything that you want people to hear before we, before we sort of wrap things up, you know, we definitely well, want to hear it. I want to, once again, Sarah, I want to thank you, the University of Texas, the, the VOSIS program. I think what an incredible uh, concept. My artist self congratulates the founder, the visionary of behind this to give Americans, to give uh, myself, to give any man, woman opportunity to use their voice, to tell their story. I mean, I am beyond blessed to survive to tell a story, first of all, not once, but twice, okay? Um, I don't want to be three times a lady. <laughs> I'm going to work really hard on taking care of myself on so many capacities. But if, in fact, God should call me 
later today or tomorrow or whatever the circumstances are, I know that I was given a platform through y'all's program and thank God for the state of Texas and you guys and and you as a, um, a reporter and, a, and interviewing, thank you for your voice and for you listening to me. Um, I'm just grateful, you know, I'm, I'm one woman. I'm one woman with a camera that has always had a vision and I'm looking to embark and I look forward to launching my path as a visual artist, as a creative in the state of Texas starting next June and this pending, there's a lot of steps still to get to this place, but it's a collaboration honoring the 49 souls of the 2016 uh, Pulse nightclub tragedy. We're going to escalate and elevate their names as a group, God willing, in June of next year, 2021, in the rotunda for seven to 10 days, God willing. Again, it's not official, but it's in motion. I declare it already. <laughs> And then after that, I'm hoping as an artist in the state of Texas that anybody who hears my voice, that anybody who wishes to speak to me, anybody that has a topic that as awareness photographer, I can help elevate your story. My goodness, I'm ready. I'm ready to collaborate. I'm ready to have dialogue. You know, uh, cancer and COVID came to my door, but I walked out of the doors, okay? And I wish every single human being that takes a moment to listen to my voice, whether it's the program staff or anybody today or any tomorrow ahead of me, that I hope that my voice brought you some information, a different perspective of how to handle when death comes to your door, breathe. We're all going to go through it. We're all going to go through it but it's your perspective of how you approach it. It doesn't have to be filled with fear. It's not gonna be easy. It's not gonna be pleasant, but it's how you bring you to the experience and visualize yourself walking out of whatever God or whoever has presented to you through crisis. Breathe, just breathe and know that um, all things are possible and that I hope all the best for everybody and that we all still just you know do our best to just be in our best and god bless everybody and, and thank you sarah for this moment no thank you so much i'm i'm gonna go ahead and stop recording i think that was a great place to end off